Hello, everyone, and welcome to our third episode of Back Ashore Schmidt Ocean Institute's YouTube series, where we take a look back at some of the research that has taken place on FALCOR with some of our esteemed scientists that sailed on board. My name is Allison, and I manage Schmidt Ocean Institute's research portfolio. And today we are joined by three scientists that studied the microbes of the deep sea on board research vessel Falcor. I'm joined by Dr. Pete Gerges from Harvard University. And Pete first sailed in 2016, but was chief scientist in 2018 on board Falcor um, in the Calif off the coast of California studying microbes. And I'm joined by Dr. Mandy Joy from University of Georgia, who sailed in 2019 in the Pescadero Basin of Mexican waters. And finally, Dr. Anna Gauthier sailed in 2017 and 2021 as a PhD student. And she's now doing her postdoc at Salk Institute. And she visited the Phoenix Island protected area. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, today, we are going to explore the wonderful world of microbes that live in the deep ocean. And we've got three experts with us that will talk more and tell us much more than I could ever say about microbes. But we do know that they're the true powerhouses in the deep sea and facilitate much of the workings of the deep sea ecosystems. So today I'm going to start with some big, broad questions so we all can learn what the importance of marine microbes are in the deep sea. And then we're going to dive deeper into each of our scientists' work, what they did on FALCOR, and what they are doing now in their lab with some of the samples and analysis that they took home with them. And then we will have plenty of time for questions by our audience and maybe some more general questions um, where we can discuss what we've learned so far. So to get started, I have a, a general question for the three of you. What is something you wish more people understood about microbes or um, why are they so important to, to you personally? So a great chance to start by sharing your passion for the marine microbes. And I see a smile on Pete's face. So we'll start with you, Pete. Oh, no, it's my tell. <laughs> well, I am. Uh, first off, thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm really excited to be here uh, with Drs. Joy and Dr. Gautier, uh, who are uh, really amazing uh, friends and colleagues. Um, microbes, goodness, I think that the, um, the thing that I am, uh, it's easy for all of us to forget is just how important they, they, they are we have a tendency to say, yeah, okay, they're important. I get it. But but the fact of the matter is the entire biosphere uh, wouldn't run. That was would not be a habitable planet were it not for microbes. Um, a quick fun fact on microbes. Uh, some of uh, my friends have heard this for me thousands of times, but there are so many microbes in the ocean that if you strung them end on end like pearls on a necklace, you would have 105,000 light years of microbes, meaning they would span the whole Milky Way galaxy. So just because individuals are small doesn't mean uh, that their collective impact isn't huge. So thanks. Thanks, Pete. I love fun-filled facts. Mandy, over to you. So I, I think about microbe, I think of, of microbes as engines, um, little machines that carry out a suite of processes that, as Pete said, help make our planet habitable and keep it habitable. And one of the really interesting things about microbes is that they mediate every imaginable process on earth from fixing carbon to reducing arsenic and selenium to methylating mercury to serving as you know decontamination factories for various pollutants. They just, they do everything and they do things that we haven't even discovered yet. And for me, that's the most exciting part, imagining the processes that are out there um, that we haven't actually discovered, but we we know they exist. And these deep sea habitats that we're going to be talking about today are ideal places to look for those novel processes. Thanks, Mandy. And Anna, what do you have for us? Uh, yeah, so... Uh, when I think about microbes in my graduate work, um, I think about what they can teach us about 
ourselves and other multicellular organisms. So deep sea microbes are really different from terrestrial microbes, and that offers the opportunity to basically see how different multicellular organisms like ourselves or invertebrate, invertebrates might respond to these microbes that have evolved in a completely different place than us. And that's what my research focused on. Um, it can te they can teach us about our own bodies and how they function, um, the different signaling pathways. I mean, what we know about our own health and immunity uh, microbes have taught us. So, and they continue to teach us how these pathways work how they might work differently than if we had different inputs uh, like from the deep sea. So I think it's really exciting um, about what they can reveal, not only about ourselves, but different organisms, both in the deep sea and, and here on land, so. Thanks, I love that, Anna. So I've got microbes. If you string them on a pearls, like an, uh, on a necklace like pearls, they'll uh, be many light years away. And I think we can all picture that better now that we've seen some images from the recent telescope. They're the little engines that could from Mandy and they can teach us about our own bodies from Anna. So we're off to a great start. I'm gonna let you each talk a little bit about the expedition that you were on on Falcor and, and what you studied. So we're gonna go in um, order from when you sailed on Falcor, so Anna, you sailed in 2017 and again in 2021. Can you tell us what you were studying while you were on board and what your goals were in terms of studying and learning about the microbes while you were at sea? Sure. So in my graduate work, I was focused on the field of innate immunity, which refers to the ability of multicellular organisms to recognize non-self microbes. And just a little background, um, it's thought that uh, multicellular organisms can recognize all innocuous microbes to prevent infection and pr protect the body. Um, and we know that certain microbes like commensals um, and pathogens um, may not be detected because they have co-evolved with the host. But for me, I wanted to know whether we could really detect all innocuous microbes. And to do this, um, our approach was to go to a place, the deep sea, where mammals have not evolved. Of course, there's diving mammals that may go to the deep sea, but um, in general, there's no evolutionary pressure for mammals or humans to recognize bacteria from the deep sea. But the way we understand innate immunity, we're supposed to be able to recognize all innocuous microbes to prevent infection and keep us healthy. And so in my project, um, I basically took different animals from the deep sea, sediments, seawater, and saw how many bacteria that I could culture from these different substrates that we collected. And I basically created a culture collection and brought it back to the lab and looked at whether our cells, mam mammalian cells, mice and humans could actually recognize uh, these bacteria we had isolated. And what I found is that a majority of them were actually not recognized by these receptors that our cells are endowed with that typically recognize the cell walls of bacteria. Um, and I defined um, the mechanism whereby they were not recognized. So what was different about their cell wall structures that made them unrecognizable to humans and mice and even shallow water invertebrates like the horseshoe crab. And what I found is that their cell wall structures had longer acyl chains or chains that um, come off of these um, lipid moieties that are in the cell wall of bacteria. And um, that was preventing recognition. So it informed us that, um, you know, there may be constraints to um, what multicellular organisms on this planet can recognize. And that may be dictated by the local environment where the, um, hosts and, and different microbes like bacteria have, have evolved. So um, that's what I um, 
did on the ship was culture these bacteria and then determine how um, they affected the signaling pathways that our bodies use to recognize microbes. Thanks, Anna. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, soon. Uh, Pete, you had sailed before, but you were chief scientist in 2018, four years ago now, it's hard to believe. And you were off the California coast to characterize the vents and seeps there. Can you tell us what your goals were for that expedition? Yeah, I'm still a little, a little stuck on the four years ago part. <laughs> so bear with me as I do my best here. But the um, that expedition, uh, we had... Um, been interested in seeing if there are hydrothermal vents off Southern California. Now, to make a, a long, complicated story as short as possible, we know that there are hydrothermal vents in the East Pacific that go all the way into the Gulf of California, which fortunately Dr. Joy is going to be telling us about. And then we know there are hydrothermal vents off the off the coast of Washington State and um, uh, uh, Vancouver and Canada. Uh, but that part of the 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 the, the vent system um isn't present off the coast of california for a bunch of seismic and tectonic region uh, re, uh, reasons and the like however there were some papers that came out that said we think there might be hydrothermal vents off palos verdes los angeles great so i have uh this desire to look for those vents and ask a bunch of questions about the animals and microbes that might live there and also deploy a new kind of biogeochemical lander, uh, a sort of the Mars lander, if you will, but for our own ocean. That's what the proposal was about. Now, interestingly, we did not find those hydrothermal vents we set out to, to look to explore, but then something happened we didn't expect. We found a lot of reefs uh, that live in these really big, beautiful aggregations like the one you see here. And when we zoom in on those reefs, you start to see this beautiful diversity of animals that are making a living in the deep ocean, um, not entirely beyond the reach of sunlight, but where it's really dim. And it's not likely that there are a bunch of algae that are growing here that they're feeding on. So understanding uh, where they're getting their food, which likely rains down from above, and understanding the diversity and complexity of this ecosystem became something that uh, we wanted to tackle. And by we, in this case, I mean my collaborator, Dr. Lisa Levin at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and her lab are really experts on these kinds of communities. And you can see we collected just as many specimens as we need and no more to really understand the kinds of organisms that live there. To whom are they related? What are the services that they are providing to one another and to the, to the broader community? Now, in addition to that, we also found uh, areas that had lots of interesting symbiosis, which is an important line of research in my lab, where we study how animals and microbes partner uh, to make a living in some really unusual places. This photo is showing you a new tool that actually the Schmidt engineers designed on the ship. We told them that we had ways to get clams, but they weren't great. And the, the, the Schmidt engineering team were amazing in literally building and welding this and being a part of our research uh, in, in real time. So it was very cool. And we used the scoop to collect clams from the sediment. Now, the other exciting thing we found were these chimneys. Now, I mentioned vents before. And hydrothermal vents often have these tall things we call chimneys that are... Um, a bunch of, uh, it's like a bunch of metal dust that got stuck together. Well, we found these chimneys off of Palos Verdes and off of Malibu, California, in about 800 meters of water or about 2,400 feet of water. And they were really exceptional. We hadn't seen these before. We know they're not the same as the high temperature vents we study because the temperatures are normal, but they are releasing methane into the water. And working with Dr. Jeff Marlowe, who's now an assistant professor at Boston University, who led this effort, we began to look at microbes that eat the methane and likely play a key role in forming these incredible chimneys you see here. Now, this is about a meter tall, right? So about three feet tall. But there's a lot that we can learn about how microbes deposit materials like carbonate, which is like chalk, and how microbes work together to build structures. So that was an amazing outcome, also unexpected. Now, in addition, I mentioned we have this um, opportunity to 
d deploy this lander. And on the day before we deployed the lander, we came across this. This is a, a, a cephalopod called Halifron. Now it's a, it's a seven armed uh, cephalopod. So it's like octopuses and squid. And this is a classic example of why uh, vessels like the Falcor with their satellite connectivity are really important. I knew that this was an uncommon uh, midwater organism because I've done enough work, but I don't, this isn't what I do for a living. So I called my friends. Uh, it was the middle of the night. It was, I think, 4 a.m. in Florida uh, when I called Dr. Brad Seibel, who hopped on the phone and helped us understand what we were looking at. And then I reached out to colleagues at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. So there are these amazing discoveries that we make, and we have an opportunity to connect with the world's experts. Now, if we uh, go to the next illustration, please, you'll see the lander that I was referring to. Um, this was a project supported by NASA and Schmidt Ocean Institute, where NASA is very interested in developing new tools to study the oceans on other ocean worlds. There are oceans as voluminous as our own on some of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. And NASA is very good at studying things in space and on the surfaces of other bodies, but oceans is a, is a little newer to them. And so they reached out to the oceanographic community, folks like myself who build tools and technologies and said, let's try and figure out how we might do this for an ocean world. Now the lander you see here is nicknamed the Abyss and it's, it's, an, it's an autonomous biogeochemical observatory. And autonomous means we program it to collect water samples, make measurements and analyses, take time-lapse videos, collect those data, and it's able to send it back to us either through using acoustics, which is actually sending data as sound through the water, or using a device called an optical modem, which is a very cool way of sending data at uh, essentially broadband speeds using light. So we were able to deploy this off the coast of Southern California there, and you can see it here at about 800 meters water depth. The little purple dots around it uh, is a swarm of jellies, which was really also cool to see. Not entirely sure why they swarm like that, but there they were. And we were able to make measurements of some of the, the fluids that come out of the seafloor that we think play a role in supporting the microbes that build those chimneys. So tools like this give NASA an opportunity uh, to um, develop tools for use in space. Um, but it's also important, if we go to the next slide, please, to, um, uh, to remind ourselves that science is one way that humankind explores the world around us, but art is equally important as well. And Schmidt Ocean Institute does a fabulous job of having an artist at sea program. And my good friend and colleague, Lily Simonson, was able to join us on this expedition. Um, to her credit, she and one of the uh, lead ROV operators and engineers, Jason Williams, said, let's see what we can do in terms of having the ROV make and paint and create some of the art we see. And so here you see the uh, ROV Sebastian wielding a paintbrush uh, and Lily uh, doing the painting through this vehicle, which was an extraordinary experience, not just for her and frankly, the Sebastian and for Jason, but for all of us as we began to see uh, this wonderful merger of art and science and engineering. And at the end there, you see the the, the final product as, that that I think is, um, for me, one of the most uh, exciting pieces of work to come out of Lily Simonson and her collaborations, in this case, with a robot sub. So it was a wonderful expedition that reminded us that sometimes we go with an idea in mind and it's completely shattered and we're left with something new and equally exciting. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Pete. I love that that spirit of finding a lot of unknown things and not quite what you are expecting. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Mandy, you sailed in 2019 and Pete gave you a, a great prompt there. So I'll let you just tell us more about what you were studying in the Pescodera Basin. Sure. Um, the Gulf of California is one of the most fascinating places on earth to me because of the intersection of hydrothermalism, which occurs at the bottom of the system with an overlying water column that is, is hypoxic. And what I mean by that is that when you think about the open ocean, the vast majority of the ocean is oxygenated, um, but it's deep, deep dark and, and cold and, and high pressure. And in the Gulf of California, 
at the bottom of the system, you have these spectacular, truly spectacular hydrothermal features like this flange shown here. Um, it doesn't really do it justice, a static picture, but this flange is discharging tremendous amounts of fluids that have been generated deep within the earth through the interaction of, of seawater with molten lava and our, our, the heat from the molten lava. These fluids are acidic, they're super hot, up to, we measured up to 390 degrees centigrade fluids, and they're being discharged from features like this in the bottom of the Gulf of California. Our interest is on the interaction of hydrothermal processes, the fluids that those processes generate, and the microbial communities that live uh, in the deep water and sediments around these, these discharge points. This is a large hydrothermal edifice in the Guaymas Basin, which is a little bit further inland than Pescadero. And here we see a couple of things that are really surprising. This is the, the famous mirror pools where, as you move down with the camera on the ROV, um, the fluid disappears because of a change in refractive index, and you see the interior of, of the rock face. These rocks that are generated by hydrothermal processes are living creatures. They, they're rocks, but they are infused with life from inside to out. And our job on this cruise was to examine the processes that are occurring in the rocks and the hydrothermal fluids and to try and identify some of the more ancient processes um, of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus cycling that occur in habitats across the earth but are accelerated to really high rates in these hydrothermal habitats. So we've been working in the plumes and in the sediments, and we continue uh, to, to work on these problems. These sorts of systems are, hydrothermal systems occur across, across the earth in the Pacific, the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, but, but the Gulf of California is really unique because of the, the low oxygen water. And you can see here that you have Riftia tube worms, um, but the majority of life on these rocks is microbial. And one of the things that I wanna point out to, to viewers is that, it's very colorful, these habitats, right? There's, there's orange and white and pink and purple, but this is the bottom of the ocean it's dark. So why is there so much color? The color is life. The color is microbial enzymes. And the color tells a scientist like me that that's where we need to go collect samples. And that's what we need to study because really interesting microbes live there. Thanks. Thanks, Mandy, I love that. I I did not know that the colors were your navigational beacon in the deep sea, and that's where you should go study. So that, that's great to know. Um, Pete, you talked some about the technology that you use, the Abyss Lander, Abyss Lander, and NASA's interest in coming on board. Could you talk a little bit, maybe more generally, um, but give us some insight into how that technology was used to study the microbes and if you know of anything NASA learned after um, your expedition that you would be willing to share, that would be great, but just the role in te of technology in studying the microbes kind of generally speaking also. Happily, whenever we do work in the deep sea, we depend on technologies to be our eyes and ears and nose. Uh, and without them, we're pretty limited. 125 years ago, during some of the earliest deep sea expeditions, scientists were dropping nets and buckets into the deep sea and bringing up samples and were amazed by what they found. And their discoveries were critical in setting in motion an entire field of deep sea research but they lacked the context that we need to really understand the deep sea and its role in the ocean system. I used to do um, uh, a, a kind of activity with students here where we would take an aquarium, uh, cover it with black paper, and I'd give them a net and I'd ask them without looking to scoop up, a, you know, the toy octopus at the bottom. And it's awfully hard. So we use technologies now to be our eyes and ears so that we're not doing everything blindly. The abyss, in particular, with respect to microbes, gives us a chance to measure the chemicals in and around the community of microbes we're interested in. It also gives us a chance to provide some nutrients to those microbes and look at how they respond. 
So we can use this as a kind of laboratory on the seafloor to say, okay, there's some microbes here. We want to go and sample them, sample their cells and their DNA and measure their chemicals, the chemicals in and around them. We want to add some nutrients and see if they respond. Do they get bigger? Do they incorporate those nutrients? What happens, right? And we always do this with an eye towards safety and caution and not put anything icky in the ocean. But it's a real fantastic way to really study what these organisms are doing without the challenges we face when we bring them to the surface and depressurize them and expose them to a lot of oxygen and the like. So that's where these technologies are hugely advantageous for our, our understanding and exploration of the deep sea. And NASA faces the same challenge. We're not going to be sending scientists in a whole laboratory to the moons of Jupiter. We need to do it through robots. Thanks, Pete. Mandy or Anna, do you have anything to add about using technology to study microbes? I'll just echo what Pete said. I mean, we have to continually develop and advance technology to allow us to, to make in situ measurements. And I think one of the biggest advantages of Pete's new lander is that we can describe in situ conditions, because when we take samples up into the laboratory and we try to grow these organisms and enrich them, we're doing it totally blind if we don't have any idea of what the in situ conditions are. So getting that in situ data, and I would argue even going a step further and getting in situ time series data of microbial community structure and function through omics techniques is, is the way of the future, because that way we'll be able to see not just how the geochemistry is changing, but how community composition and activity is responding to those changes. Yeah, thanks, Mandy. That's there's definitely room in that field to grow. I know it, it's still kind of j just blooming as as a field, and we have a, a lot of um, innovation and room there. Um, we do have a question for Pete. Um, how important are milk crates and ratchet straps for building your landers? And I was also wondering if you could just talk briefly. Um, has the lander been used in the past four years once you um, got off Falcor? Yeah, I cannot help but wonder if this is someone we know, because uh, 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 any of us doing seagoing work realize that we sometimes depend on um, the simplest of tools uh, to solve our problems. So, for example, collecting samples from the deep sea, uh, we we find that milk crates do a great job with rocks, for example, and ratchet straps do just fine. So they are very, very important. A lot of zip ties. A lot of ratchet straps, a lot of milk crates. The, um, you know, to the to the second part of that question, could you remind me again, Allison, what they asked? Oh, have you used the lander since you right. used them on Falcor four years ago? Oh yes, yeah. So we've had an opportunity to do a couple more deployments. In fact, one is ongoing right now in the Santa Barbara Basin, uh, and. Um, without going too far into the weeds with this story, but we deployed it with the idea of doing a short deployment for just a few months. And then unfortunately, the robotic vehicle that was supposed to recover it had its had a failure. And so we were unable to pick it back up. But the interesting thing to note is that we set the lander up with that in mind. The lander affords us an opportunity to say, you know what, instead of just running for three months and turning off, we actually programmed the lander to run for 18 months. So though it's, you know, and, and right now we're at about month 12-ish or so, uh, and we're planning on picking it up in about four weeks. So with a tool like this, you're able to hedge your bets a bit and say, well, let's assume we can't get it for some reason. Let's just make sure we take advantage of the time to collect the data. And so now we're actually quite excited to see this year-long data set on oxygen and pH and microbial samples in the bottom of the Santa Barbara Basin that we just did not expect to get. Another unexpected moment. It's just what I was about to say, but it sounds like you'll have your work cut out for you in about another month or so with all that data. So that's very exciting. Yep. Anna, you recently published a, pa a paper in Nature Immunology about the immunosilent properties, which you talked about a little bit. And I was wondering if you could talk about, in general, a little bit kind of what um, the role microbes can can help with humanity, if you will, 
um, when you went in 2017 to the Phoenix Islands, you had no way of knowing what the world was going to face in about three years. And then when you returned, we were still, I would say, in the midst of the global pandemic. And I know some of your work um, kind of talked about the future of using microbes to um, help with viruses and, and more research definitely needs to be done. But could you address that a little bit? Uh, sure, of course. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just to touch on immuno silence again and, and what that means for the audience, um, it means that the receptors that our bodies use to see microbes and respond to them um, do not actually see some of these deep sea bacteria in specific ways. So in my study, I was testing one specific cell wall structure that makes up a majority of the outer layer of all gram negative bacteria. And that molecule is called lipopolysaccharide. And typically lipopolysaccharide activates a very strong immune response to prevent bacteria from infecting us. But many of the deep sea bacteria had these lipopolysaccharide structures that were unrecognizable to the receptors we know that, that sense lipopolysaccharide. And although that may be alarming to some, um, you know, pathogens do this, commensals do this, bacteria that have co-evolved with us do this, but um, it was, you know, un unknown that deep sea bacteria could do it too. And they have no co-evolutionary history with, with humans. Um, and we thought about ways we could take advantage of this in terms of biotechnology. So it might be really useful to have cell wall structures that are not recognized and do not cause inflammation um, in the medical field. So for example, for vaccines, you need to activate your immune system so that the vaccine functions properly. And right now, um, a lot of these things that activate our immune system, they're called adjuvants, are really strong or not ideal for the pathogen that we want to immunize against. So the deep sea could certainly serve as a reservoir for adjuvants that would activate our immune systems in different ways and make vaccines work better. Um, Another idea we had was that these silent, which means they're unrecognizable to our immune systems via these receptors, could serve as delivery vehicles for drugs or viral vectors um, in the body that need to get delivered to certain organs or a certain place. So um, they could provide new technologies that um, people are working on already, but new variations that wouldn't be possible without um, the microbes of the deep sea and the structures that they have and what those structures are, are teaching us. So um, moving forward, I think in, in biomedical research and the development of vaccines and other uh, technologies for drug delivery, the deep sea holds great premise. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, it sounds like the deep sea could still teach us a lot going back mm -hmm. to your earlier theme about teaching us about the human body. Uh, Mandy or Pete, do you have anything to add to Anna's response? No, go ahead, Pete. I think that uh, Anna's work is fantastic and that there's, you know, uh, Dr. Joy and I have talked about this many times before. We're often asked like, why, why bother with the deep sea, right? There's even a New Yorker cartoon of people sitting around saying, I don't know why, but I just don't care about the deep sea. Uh, there's a hundred reasons to care about the deep sea and that's just for starters and dr gautier's work is a real clear illustration of what we can learn even uh, uh, about ourselves by studying the microbes of the deep thanks pete i laugh because i did see that cartoon not because i agree that the deep sea is not important mandy did you have something to add no i'm good i, I think you okay yeah. <laughs> great um, Mandy, you talked about this a little bit in the video and in your explanation of your cruise, but one of the things that got a lot of attention was the what was called the upside down lake of microbial action 
that you saw. And my favorite part of that was actually your reaction to discovering something new and unseen before. And so I was wondering if you could just talk about the excitement of uh, live streaming science and making the discoveries and um, microbial science, but really all science um, exciting, even when other people might not think it is because your reaction really excited me. Yeah, so when, when you see videos on TV, you know, BBC documentaries or National Geographic documentaries showing hydrothermal vents or um, some other, you know, deep sea corals, which are spectacularly beautiful. Um, all of these habitats just captivate the imagination. I mean, you know, a lot of these creatures from horror movies are actually deep sea animals. You know, the the alien is is a critter from the deep sea, and but it's not just science fiction. It's just these habitats boggle the mind. I mean, you go to places like Yellowstone and you see venting of fluids and mud pots and volcanoes erupting. Um, but this is happening on the bottom of the ocean. And I, I've been, you know, in the Alvin a couple of meters away from one of these features many times. And still on our expedition on the Falcor in 2019, when we were you know, moving Sebastian up and down and, and just watching, you know, the fluid quote unquote disappear because the, the, the temperature gradient and the way the light travels through low versus high temperature fluids, it's coming up right here. I mean, I literally could have sat there all day and just gone up and down and my jaw would have been on the floor the entire time because every scientist is a little kid inside. You know, we all are little kids inside, but I think scientists, we let our little kid out more than most other people do. And we're not embarrassed to have our little kid become gleeful and excited and just filled with wonder and to show that to other people, because that's how we share our enthusiasm and passion for what we do. And I think sharing that passion makes people interested, it gets their attention, and it gives you an opportunity to teach them something in a way that they remember. I mean, I get emails still, you know, three years out. Um, I get emails once a month or more from somebody who sees those videos and is just like, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. That is so amazing. Explain to me how it works again. And the fact that this is still happening years later it tells me that, you know, I don't remember how many times that video was, was viewed when we were at sea, but it was hundreds of thousands of times. I mean, it was a tremendously popular video. And I remember the live stream had all these people, but what's even more impressive is that it's still out there. And it's still, when I show this in my classes, the kids are like, can we see that again? Can you show, can you pop, can you do that again? Because they just can't believe it. I gave a talk at a, a, to a group of third graders last week. And I showed that video and I showed lots of videos actually. That was the only video that the kids were raising their hands and jumping up and down and going, do that again and explain to me why, why, how that works. And then you take the opportunity to explain to them that these, these high temperature fluids are food. They contain food for the microbial populations and they're feeding these populations of microbes that are very abundant in these localized habitats in the deep sea, but similar microbes occur in your gut. You know, sulfate reducing bacteria and methanogens, they're in your gut. They're impacting you and they're impacting your life. And studying these environments in the deep sea helps us better understand how you and your body functions. And when you bring that home to them, you go from the deep sea, the bottom of the ocean into their gut, that, that makes a connection to the deep sea that I think is really valuable and powerful for everybody. I love that, Mandy. You made me excited all over again. And uh, <laughs> Pete, I could see you smiling. Do you have any moments of joy or similar excitements that you would like to share about microbes or just exploration in general? I mean, so many moments that we just we don't have the time. I uh, I'm smiling because you know I've I've worked with Dr. Joy for for quite a while, and their enthusiasm is infectious. I think the the thing that I, I, I'm excited to perhaps share with those who are listening in is that for, um, you know, we live in this um, culture where, uh, you know, we're, we're so guarded about what we feel. And uh, certainly in academia, especially at, 
at you know these these institutions that that are you know really uh active with research and there's lots of bright people i mean across academia in general people get really shy about uh showing their enthusiasm and shy about being wrong and i would just want to encourage anybody who's listening who is a student or an early career scientist or a mid-career scientist like it is okay to let your enthusiasm show and it is okay to be wrong because you're never going to get to right unless you stumble your way through wrong and that's the beauty of working in the deep sea is that we are we're often wrong <laughs> and so we get down and we're surprised we're like whoa my assumptions were completely off base and that's how we learn something new thanks pete your enthusiasm is also equally infectious as mandy's and anna to to steal words from pete do you have anything that you have felt enthusiasm or joy over in your studies that you would like to share also um i mean it was just a dream to be able to um study the deep sea in, in the way that i did but i think a question that i'm excited about um that my uh, mentor randy rogen is also excited about is understanding how the immune systems of these deep sea invertebrates that um are prevalent like corals and anemones um function because they have predators in the deep sea too, but everything happens slower in the deep sea. So wound healing and defense mechanisms are probably very different. And how do those work? And in 2021, we started to look at how the innate immune systems of these corals might recognize bacteria. And um, we found that deep sea bacteria were most likely recognized or these corals responded to them. Whereas when we took terrestrial bacteria, like our common laboratory coli, they didn't respond to E. coli at all. So, I mean, understanding how they heal from wounds after being eaten, for example, by a predatory sea star, how their immune systems function and how they interact with the microbial species in the deep sea to survive over thousands of years is just totally fascinating to me, totally foreign from what we do with mammalian or multicellular innate immunity in the laboratory for biomedical research right now. And I think it offers like a lot of really exciting discoveries um, in the future. Thanks, Anna, definitely very important work. And I think um, you just kind of alluded to one of my last questions is we all know the science doesn't happen overnight. And you've all talked a little bit about why you were on board Falcor and what you were hoping to discover and either did or didn't. But I want to give you each a chance to talk a little bit about what happened once you got back into your lab, the analysis that you did or are still working on. and if you had any discoveries or new outcomes that you would like to share um, with us, that would be wonderful. So I'll start with Mandy this time. Great. So I'm going to give a shout out to my colleague, uh, Karthik Anantheraman. He's a virologist at the University of Wisconsin, and we've been working together since we met at a conference in May of 2018. Um, Karthik studies viruses in the deep sea, as I said, and one of the really fascinating things that he has discovered uh, along with his postdoc and a grad student is that viruses similar to the ones that we see at hydrothermal vents um, engage in hor horizontal gene transfer of, of metabolic genes in human and environmental microbes, in microbiomes. So it's not a lot of the vi viruses that we see in vents are similar to ones that are in our own um, gut microbiome, which is kind of crazy. Um, they do sort of the same things. And sulfur metabolism is a great example of this parallel between the deep sea and our gut. Uh, so Karthik was recently awarded an NIH Young Investigator Grant uh, to study these similarities, to try and learn more from these environmental uh, viromes uh, to, to try and help predict uh, human impacts of, of disease. On the more sort of biogeochemical, microbial, physiological side, we have some really interesting enrichments growing from our crews that are um, 
seem to be suggestive of some really interesting novel metabolisms related to oil being converted to, converted to methane at fairly high rates in some of these Guaymas and Pescadero uh, sites. So we're continuing to work on that and we're looking forward to going back um, next year, the year after on, on our next expedition. We have, you know, every expedition generates uh, 10 times more questions than it does answers. Um, it's a self-perpetuating machine. And, you know, you never, ever have enough data, samples, knowledge. So we just keep going and going, which I love. The spirit of science, for sure. Pete, would you like to update us? Yeah, you know, going back to um, the unexpected, we found ourselves going out with this idea of looking for high temperature fluids coming out of out of the seafloor in and around Los Angeles. And we didn't find it. But I want to be clear, that doesn't mean it's not there, right? There is no way that we have proved by any stretch of the imagination that there is no such place. So it's probably still out there, right? There was enough evidence from some of those earlier papers to suggest that it's there, we just missed it. Or maybe it's turned off for now, right? However, the work we did really... Uh, change the way we think about these microbes that eat methane, how quickly they can eat methane, and how they can work with other microbes to build structures that fuel that methane uh, consumption. And what's also cool is it's likely that these structures um, also tell us something about the water coming um, up from the seafloor through these structures as well. So we think that they may be, uh, these waters may be providing these microbes with something they're not getting out of seawater that also stimulates their activity. Now, one of my favorite parts of uh, outcomes, if you want to look at it that way, is that Dr. Jeff Marlowe, now Professor Jeff Marlowe at Boston University, is continuing uh, with this line of research. When I, you know, a project starts in my lab, nothing makes me happier than to see the persons working on it take it along with them, or maybe help move it to another lab, right? It, it, it is the way science should be run. We're all in this together and we all bring different skills to the table. So Dr. Marlow and his group now are continuing to look at these, at these carbonates through a different lens, trying to use different isotopes to understand how old are they? And when were they made? Uh, what is the source of the carbon that makes the carbonate and so on? So there's a huge area of research going on. Now, there's another part relates to Dr. Lisa Levin's group. Uh, a student of hers, Dr. Jennifer Lee, just finished and we just published our paper on the ecosystem services that seeps provide. So those big chimneys I showed you are a part of a seep that's about a kilometer and a half long and 300 meters wide. It's big and it's covered with all that yellow microbial stuff. So we called it the yellow brick road. And Dr. Lee's project really focused on the kinds of animals that she could observe through the video surveys done by Falcor. And she began to realize that a lot of these aren't the normal quote unquote animals we see at seeps, but rather there are a lot of animals that come from around the local environment and come into the seeps and they might be feeding there. It's possible they lay their, their eggs there and have their babies there because they're safer in the midst of those chemicals. Or maybe those chemicals are doing something else. But whatever the case is, Dr. Lee's work showed that these that there are these ecosystem services, if you will, provided by these seeps, not just to their normal endemic animals, the ones that live there, but to other animals that we often think of as coming from somewhere else, including some that are part of California's commercial fishery. Right. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. But I'm going to stop there in the interest of time. Thanks, Pete. Very exciting and friendly reminder to our scientists to share all of your upcoming data products and publications with SOI so that we are able to stay updated on your work. Anna, you talked a little bit about some of the questions you and Dr. Rochin are starting to ask, um, but would you like to add anything else that you haven't had a chance to speak about? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll just say um, it was a uh, challenge and also a joy to develop um, in 2021 a basically a host response assay where we could measure the host response of deep sea corals on on ship um, because we we're able to keep them alive for several days after collecting them um, which is pretty novel um, usually the responses of deep sea animals are 
investigating using transcriptomics, um, but it's hard to know the efficacy of a transcriptomic response that you observe through sequencing. So um, now we're excited to basically repeat these experiments in the laboratory with related shallow water octocorals to see how similar they are to their deep sea relatives, um, whether or not they have local recognition of microbes. Um, and it seems from initial experiments that they do not recognize deep sea microbes as well as their deep sea counterparts, which would support our hypothesis that um, immune systems have evolved in a local environment. And when environments are crossed that would not typically be crossed, um, you see unexpected responses um, and that can be very informative. So I'm excited about that work and in the laboratory with the shallow water or octocorals. Excellent, thank you. Well, I think we've covered all aspects of science just in our last question, testing hypotheses, doing lab experiments, and still having more and more questions to ask after all is said and done. So it's been a really great conversation with the three of you about uh, how science works and the enthusiasm for microbes and discovery and learning and seeing things we didn't expect to see and some things that we did expect to find, so it's been really great. I wanted to thank all of you again for this discussion as we wrap up. I don't think we have any more questions from the audience coming in. And so this will be our final Back Ashore episode of the year. So I want to wish everyone a uh, warm, if you're in a cold spot, joyful holidays. And in the new year, we will be launching Falcor 2 and continuing our journey on exploration and discovery with the new vessel. And I am sure we'll have some more Back Ashore episodes exploring topics that we have and continue to study at Schman Ocean Institute with the oceanographic community. So thank you all so much for joining us and I hope to see you all soon. Thank you for the invitation.